But there's another, even greater reason that I have not made the conversion to a smartphone. Uh, a reason that is a bit more interesting, and that reason is privacy concerns. Unfortunately, privacy concerns are not simply limited to smartphones, but to the internet more broadly. Now, the internet has amazing benefits, and that is an understatement. The internet, in fact, has unbelievable, revolutionary benefits. And I am strongly convicted that the internet will be a very positive force for humanity and for human progress. And I mean that when I say that. That said, there are also dangers. And the danger comes when the internet is no longer free. If the internet ever becomes unfree, it will morph into a tool utilized by the rich and the powerful to control populations. Now you may ask, how might the internet become unfree? And what does an unfree internet look like? There are, as I see it, two variables that, play, that place the free internet in danger. One is private and the other is public. We'll begin with private. First, a private consolidation of web traffic and of web sites. A web run and controlled by the very few in which web traffic becomes ever more concentrated in a small number of powerful hegemonic websites. And in the last 10 years especially, internet traffic has intensely consolidated. We no longer live in the wild, wild west era of the internet. Do you all remember that time? Remember the late 90s and early 2000s? It's morphing into a system where the internet is more like cable television where you have major channels, right? Major websites. And as fewer and fewer websites dominate the internet, the ability of those private companies to control internet activity grows exponentially. Searches can be manipulated. Posts deleted and placed down the memory hole. What happens if you say or do something that one of these companies does not like? For some of them already, and potentially in the future for all of them, especially if there's an internet ID in the future, a potential ban, a ban for that user. Well, you may say, well, if you're banned from a, from a platform, just go to another platform. But what if there is no other platform or at least any other significant platform? What do you do? Furthermore, by collecting data, and they collect a lot of data, the big, the top websites, lots and lots and lots of data. These companies learn almost everything about you. Let's consider Google. I don't know how many, what the average number of searches each person does a day is I imagine it's somewhere between 5 and 15, okay? Um, we're going to take an easy mathematical number and say 10. You may say, well, that's higher than average, or maybe that's lower than average. I'm not sure, but we're going to say 10. Let's say you do 10 searches a day. 
365 days in a year. So that's 3,650 searches in a year. Over the course of a decade, that's 36,500 searches. You can learn a whole lot about a person if you have tens of thousands of searches that that particular person made. And then you can use that data, whatever that data is, your, uh, uh, your food preferences, your style preferences, your political opinions, just anything, anything whatsoever. You can use that data, those tens of thousands of searches over you know, a long period of time to construct. Remember, we've had Google now for what, like 15 years. You can use that data con to construct a very accurate profile about each man and woman across the globe. The second variable that could lead to an unfree internet is public. The free internet faces tremendous danger when you have a Snoopy government, a state apparatus that wishes to surveil the internet in order to spy on the people. These two variables, public and private, are dangerous on their own merits. But what happens when a consolidated internet cooperates with a Snoopy government? The results are not pretty. And even more disturbing, this seems to be precisely the direction that we are headed in. In 2013, Edward Snowden exposed to the world the PRISM program. PRISM is a secret surveillance program in which the NSA, or National Security Agency, collects internet data in cooperation with nine different internet companies. And since 2013, we have learned even more about this program. And the surveillance does not simply end with internet browsing. Let's take a look at a whistleblower, a whistleblower that is a little less known than Edward Snowden. Let's take a look at William Binney. William Binney was a top official, right at the very top, of the NSA for over 30 years, until he resigned in October 2001. Since that time, William Benny has become one of the leading whistleblowers on government surveillance. According to Benny, the NSA records and then stores in massive data facilities the audio of at least 80% of phone calls in the United States. And you heard that right, the audio. This is a man who worked practically the head of the NSA for 30 years. Now, does that mean that a human being is listening? No, it does not. Unless you are a person of special interest, and those persons are very, very few in number, your phone conversation is not being listened to. It is being recorded and then stored. Furthermore, the technology is available for the NSA to transcribe phone conversations, making them searchable. And if the transcription picks up something of interest, that's when a live human being may perhaps listen to the audio. When asked whether or not they utilize this transcription technology, the NSA refused to say one way or another. Now, let's assume that the NSA is run by benevolent people who love this country and the people within it. And I mean this absolutely sincerely, totally sincere, when I say that I believe 
that there are many, many people working for the NSA who do indeed love this country and the people within it. Okay, Let's assume for the sake of argument that the entire NSA is well-meaning. Maybe it is, all right? Okay, well, what happens if a malicious person takes charge of the government and all of a sudden he has all of these tools at his disposal? Imagine what a Hitler or a Stalin would do with some of this technology. And isn't that a question worth considering? I think it is. Because what we have in place right now, again, even if the NSA is completely benevolent, what we have in place right now as far as capability is, I almost said Soviet level, is actually beyond Soviet level. Not in the sense that anybody faces consequences for their speech, as they did in the Soviet Union. We have freedom of speech in this country. The Soviets were opening mail and reading letters, all for your safety, of course. Yeah, right. Uh, but actually, the system we have right now, uh, it's funny, actually, mail is one of the few places to go nowadays. Um, it's your phone conversations, your text messages, the websites you visit. By the way, for all you porn addicts, uh, the government knows all of that, all right? So, uh, um, again, not a literal person, right? Um, but it's there, and it's available for them to access. Um, it's just the reality we live in, just letting you know. We've already seen the negative effects of this system. One of the biggest impacts of the surveillance program has been a severe chilling effect on internet behavior. According to a study published in the Berkeley Techno Technology Law Journal in April 2016, internet users have increasingly self-censored their behavior and searches since the Snowden revelations in 2013. And this trend, no doubt, will continue unless we turn this ship around. William Benny, again, top NSA official for 30 years, had this to say in 2014. Whether or not it's correct, all right, I think it's significant that this former NSA official for 30 years would say something like this. He said in 2014, quote, the ultimate goal of the NSA is total population control. <laughs> All right, well, but it's not simply the NSA. Again, it is also the consolidated power of private internet companies, companies that have become practically indistinguishable from government itself. Google recently launched a new program called Project Loon. Under this project, Google will place hundreds, if not thousands, of balloons into the stratosphere. 11 miles above the ground to provide wireless internet to rural and remote areas. Sounds nice, right, on the surface. Um, but do we really want a powerful, private, multi-billion dollar corporation to have thousands of unmanned aerial vehicles, also known as drones, uh, uh, floating above our heads in the sky? Uh, does anybody else like see any even just a, a little hint of danger in something like that? Again, let's assume, for sake of argument, that Google is run by benevolent people. And this very well may be. I don't know those guys. They might be just very excellent, well-meaning people. We'll give them the benefit of the doubt. But again, what if a malicious person or group of people takes charge of Google in the future? with access to all of this power. That's a very frightening thought. Is that a possibility that we are willing to expose ourselves to? Um, is this really uh, something that we're down with? 
we're going to have to make that that decision. It's one of the reasons why I think it would be useful to to explore alternative search engines. I like startpage.com personally, um, or alternative social media, whatever. Um, and that's not to say don't use the big the big boys. Obviously, I'm this is on YouTube, right? Owned by Google. By the way, what ever happened to antitrust uh, mm -hmm. uh, legislation? Does that just it, does that not exist anymore? Like, I've never seen a trust or a monopoly this big before. Like, this makes uh, Standard Oil look like look like nothing um, by comparison. But anyway, um, the the last uh, on this subject of surveillance and consolidated control. Um, what about these IPAs? All right, not India Pale Ales. Intelligent personal assistance. The program on your smartphone, like Siri or Google Now. A few weeks ago, I was at a friend's house, and he was using I can't remember if it was Siri or Google Now, one of those two. And he would pick up the phone, right? And without pressing any button, he would say a command, and it would follow that command. And I didn't, I didn't think much of it at first. <laughs> but then, all of a sudden, it dawned on me. And it felt like a, a freight train crashing into me at 500 miles an hour. And when I came to this realization, I had this, this just incredibly sinking feeling in my gut, like a, like a rock just plunging to the bottom of my stomach. And I realized, all of a sudden, as he's using it, that device is listening. And I like, uncontrollably <gasps> just gasp really really, really quickly and then I didn't say anything um, I just kept the thought to myself and um, told myself okay in my memory look that up later uh, you know maybe it's not look it up later well I didn't need to do any research to know that that was precisely what it was doing listening that is sure enough the next day I do some research and that is precisely what is going on. The license agreements for these IPAs are extremely vague and leave enormous room for companies to do with it whatsoever they wish. This is Apple's privacy statement for Siri. When you use Siri in dictation, the things you say and dictate will be recorded and sent to Apple to process your request. Wow. <laughs> Some privacy statement. Huh. Yeah. Uh, this one's a little better. This is Google's voice and audio privacy statement. Google records your voice and other audio plus a few seconds before when you use audio activations like saying commands like OK Google. Your audio is saved to your account only when you're signed in and voice and audio activity is turned on. So there's a few more qualifiers there, but still, what, what does that mean exactly? Just, again, extremely vague, extremely ambiguous. Evidently, upon further research, uh, it, it appears that the type of listening that your smartphone is doing is passive, quote, passive listening. Okay. Uh, that's still very unclear and um, not sure exactly what that entails. Let's say that this is something we can live with, okay, for sake of argument. Passive listening, that is. Would it be that much of a stretch in the future, right, like 10, 15, 20 years from now, in a super high-tech world for that device to go from passive listening to active listening? Is that a world that we want to live in? No world I want to live in. Can't we at least 
as a society, as a culture, can't we at least debate all of this before we plunge headfirst into it? I think this is worthy of debate. Let's debate it. But instead, we, you know, people aren't talking about it. It's bizarre, man. Like, it's one of the it's one of the reasons why I made this channel to talk about things that I believe are not being talked about enough in the public discourse. 